Thanks for listening to the Grace First podcast. If you want to know more about us, head on over to gracefirst.church. Or if you're in the Wichita area, come visit us Sundays at 1015. About 30 years ago after his birth, Jesus asked a question to a group of his followers about his identity, a question that has echoed throughout the ages. In Mark chapter 8, verse 27, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that I am? They reported that some people thought he was possibly John the Baptist come to life again. Others thought he was one of the Old Testament prophets, like Elijah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel. And up to our present time, there is still a diversity of views. Some people think he was no more than a Jewish holy man. Others think he may have been the leader of a hallucinogenic cult. Hindus believe he was an important guru who came in contact with ultimate reality. Muslims honor him as a great, a great prophet who taught a simple message of monotheism, but certainly not the Son of God. Today, like when Jesus asked that question, there is still a diversity of opinions. In our passage today, I believe a good answer to the identity of Jesus is provided. Our passage today is the famous story of the visit of the Magi to baby Jesus and his parents, Joseph and Mary. As we read our passage, we will emphasize three important points. First, the joy of the Magi. Second, the worship of the Magi. And third, the gifts of the Magi. And they correspond to the points in your outline if you are taking notes. So let's read Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 15. And I will be reading from the NASB. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he? Who has been born king of the Jews. For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard it, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Verse 4. And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he began to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and ascertained from them the time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child, and when you have found him, report to me that I too may come and worship him. Verse 9, and having heard the king, they went their way, and lo, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and they came into the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their own country by another way. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. And he arose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. And was there until the death of Herod, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, out of Egypt did I call my son. Amen. 
The first slide, please. So who are these magi? The magi were priests and teachers who rose to prominence during the Persian Empire, approximately 550 to 300 BC. These magi probably lived in the Arabian desert. They were men who excelled in astronomy and astrology, which were both closely linked in those days. Uh, they keenly observed the stars and planets for any alterations in their usual appearances. They believed that if anything unusual happened with the heavenly bodies, it probably meant that God was breaking through to communicate something special. Therefore, it is no surprise that when a brilliant star shines in the sky, they sought to determine its significance. But have you ever wondered, though, if the Magi saw the star in the east, and they're from the east, why they went west to Judea and not to their east, such as India or Mongolia? Interestingly, the word east in Hebrew also means shining. Therefore, Matthew, a Jewish man who is familiar with Hebrew, may have thought shining when he used the Greek word east in his gospel account. Therefore, verse 2 could be read, we saw his star at its shining and have come to worship him. About that star, Bible scholars have proposed several theories about its identity. Some think it was Halley's Comet. Others think it could have been a conjunction uh, that is an alignment of Saturn and Jupiter, which gave off a brilliant light. Still others believe it was Sirius, the so-called dog star. Of these possibilities, one Bible commentator wrote, in those years, that is around the time of Jesus, birth of Jesus, on the first day of the Egyptian month, Missouri, Sirius, the dog star, rose helically, that is at sunrise, and shined with extraordinary brilliance. The name Missouri means the birth of a prince. And to those ancient astrologers, such a star would undoubtedly mean the birth of some great king. We cannot tell what star the Magi saw, but it was their profession to watch the heavens, and some heavenly brilliance spoke to them of the entry of a king into the world. In addition to heavenly bodies giving off light, some scholars think that the great light seen by the Magi could have been generated by a different source. The Hebrew word and Greek word for star both mean any great light, not necessarily a star. Could the great light recognized by the Magi not be from a heavenly body, but rather from the Shekinah glory of God himself, a light similar to the great light that lit the tabernacle in the days of Moses? All these are only speculations. What we do know for certain is the Magi recognized a brilliant light in the sky that signaled the birth of a king. So the Magi make the arduous journey from the Arabian desert through the rugged hills of Judea to Jerusalem, a natural place for foreigners to visit first. The Magi ask, probably a Herodian official at Herod's palace, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east or at its shining, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Second slide. So who is King Herod? King Herod reigned over Judea from 37 to 4 BC. We know him as Herod the Great, and in many ways he earned that title. He upheld peace in Judea through, during his reign, which was certainly a difficult task to perform. This, her, this earned him the favor from Caesar Augustus in Rome. Furthermore, he built many beautiful gardens, canals, and buildings, including the Jewish temple. He did have one serious flaw, though. He was deeply suspicious. If he suspected anyone a rival to his throne... That person was killed. He had three of his sons murdered. He had one of his wives killed along with her mother. Just before his death, Herod arrested and imprisoned many people in Jericho. Orders were given to kill all of them 
the moment after he, that's Herod, died, that there might be greater mourning the day of his death. One Bible commentator wrote, It is clear how such a man would feel when news reached him that a child was born who was destined to be king. Herod was troubled, and Jerusalem was troubled too, for Jerusalem knew well the steps that Herod would take to pin down this story and to eliminate that child. Jerusalem knew Herod, and Jerusalem shivered as it waited for his inevitable reaction. In verse 4, Herod gathers the religious leaders to get more information. They read to him a prophecy written about 500 years earlier by the prophet Micah about a king that God would raise up. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, For out of you shall come forth a ruler, in Hebrew that's Mashal, who will shepherd my people Israel. While not cited by Matthew, but read by Jake, this prophecy ends with whose beginnings are from long ago, from the days of eternity. This is important. J. Barton, in his book, The Encyclopedia of Bible Prophecy, wrote, from eternity gives a deeper tone to the prophecy, which might come as easily to Micah as to any later prophet. It shows that the Messiah will not be only David restored, but one who was in the beginning with God. We are not called on to explain away this solemn and wonderful forecast, especially when we have seen it fulfilled in the baby of Bethlehem. Micah could not understand his own deep saying, but how foolish of us to discredit it when history has made its meaning plain. In response to hearing this prophecy, Herod summons the Magi and sends them to Bethlehem to search for baby Jesus. He said that he too wished to come and worship the baby, but his one desire was to murder the child born to be king. Third slide. Verse 9 says, After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, or at its shining, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. So the Magi find their way to the house of Joseph and Mary where Jesus lay. With them, they bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, frankincense and myrrh are sap from trees that are in the Middle East. It is believed that each gift represented something about Jesus and his work. Gold is the gift for a king. It was customary to give kings a gift in those days. And gold, the most desired of metals, is a fitting gift for a king. Frankincense is a gift for a priest. It was in temple worship and temple sacrifices that the sweet perfume of frankincense was used. Myrrh is the gift for one who is to die. It was used to embalm bodies of the dead. Therefore, even at the cradle of Jesus, the gifts of the Magi foretold that Jesus would be king, priest, and savior of the world. Next slide. Soon after the visit of the Magi, Joseph is prompted by God to depart for Egypt to preserve the life of Jesus. Their escape to Egypt was entirely natural. In the centuries prior to the birth of Jesus, Jews often went to Egypt to escape persecution, war, or some other peril. As a result, there were many Jewish colonies in Egypt at the time of Jesus' birth. In fact, in the city of Alexandria, Egypt, there was approximately one million Jews residing there. So we can safely assume that wherever they went in Egypt, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus would be able to live alongside fellow Jews. Interestingly, Matthew quotes an Old Testament prophecy from Hosea 11.1 that says, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now, in its original context... Hosea 11.1 refers to 
the departure of Israel from Egypt in the time of Moses. Christian scholars believe Matthew's quotation here serves two purposes. First, it would add persuasiveness for a Jewish audience reading his gospel account in the first century. Second, it adds weight to Matthew's theme of salvation. Just as God provided salvation for Egypt for the Jews in the time of Moses, Jesus offers salvation from sins for all people. Out of Egypt, I called my son. You can remove the slides, thank you. So returning to our outline, let's consider our points. Number one, the joy of the Magi. Verse 10 says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Our English word, joy, is the best translation of the Greek word, Greek word kara. Kara means inner joy that satisfies. It is like charis, the Greek word for grace. Note, in both Greek words, the root kar is used, denoting a close connection between joy and grace. When we consider the Gospel of Matthew as a whole, it associates joy with the arrival of and participation in God's salvation. It begins in our passage with the description of the great joy felt by the Magi when they saw baby Jesus, and it ends with the great joy felt by a group of his women followers when they identified his empty tomb after his resurrection. In between those two accounts, there are references to great joy for people who accept the words that Jesus speaks and who discover the kingdom of God through Jesus' ministry. May I ask you, what brings you joy? What brings you joy that satisfies? I am sure we can all think of times when we have felt joyful. Perhaps you were joyful when your sports team won a big game. Or maybe you were joyful when you graduated from college or received the keys to your first car or your first home. Maybe it was a particular Christmas day when you received a gift that you had hoped for. As delightful as those things uh, made you feel, can you honestly say they brought you joy that satisfies? Have you ever felt joy that brought you satisfaction and lasting contentment? Sadly, for many people, the answer is no. Perhaps there are people in here or people listening via live stream who can relate to the popular YouTube, uh, YouTube song that says, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Perhaps you are trying to fill a void in your heart with material things, but they simply won't bring you joy that satisfies. Regarding this issue, C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity, Creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction of those de desires exists. A baby feels hunger. Well, there is such thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such thing as water. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not mean the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. I must keep in my, excuse me, I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that country and help others do the same. All of us have desire, a desire in our heart that only our Creator can satisfy. If you have gone through life never finding lasting joy, peace, and contentment, then I ask you to consider a relationship with the one who can fill that void. Material possessions cannot. Sports cannot. Drugs and alcohol cannot. Only a relationship with Jesus, God's Son, 
can truly fill that void. He will fill your heart with peace and a joy that satisfies. A kara or joy similar to what the Magi felt when they knelt before baby Jesus. Second point in your outline, the worship of the Magi. Verse 11 says, after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. There is a rich theological truth implied in this verse. In Matthew 1.21, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph saying, your wife will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Now, Jesus is transliterated from the Hebrew word, Hebrew name, Yeshua. Yeshua is broken into Yah, which is an abbreviation of Yahweh, and the verb Yasha, which means save. Therefore, Jesus literally means God saves. Now, this begs a question. Jesus saves who from what? The what is our sins. There are de- several definitions for sin. One is missing the mark set by God for human conduct. Another is breaking God's moral law. Some theologians have equated sin with ignorance, error, and hostility. Paul the Apostle makes this comment about the totality of sin in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because of our sins, every person is guilty of breaking God's moral law. The what is our sins? Excuse me, the who, the what is our sins? Now, the who part is a fascinating question. Ask Jewish people in Jesus' day, and they would undoubtedly say, God's salvation is for the Jews only. Perhaps they would quote Deuteronomy 14.2. The Lord has chosen you, that is the Jewish people, to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Or maybe they would recite Amos 3.2, where God says through the prophet Amos, you only have I chosen among the families of the earth. But praise be to God, with the birth of Jesus, God's salvation extends to non-Jewish people also. The Apostle Paul says in Acts 17.30, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent. The who refers to people from every nation, Jewish and non-Jewish. The rich and beautiful theological truth implied in the worship of the Magi is that all people can be saved from the penalty of their sins through repentance and faith in Jesus. About 1,800 years after the birth of Jesus, an Englishman by the name of E.P. Scott took the good news of Jesus to the people of India. About one particular encounter with a group of people there, we have this account. After a journey of few days, Reverend Scott was met by a large group of warriors who quickly surrounded him, each one pointing a spear towards his heart. The missionary... expected that he would die. So he decided to use his last few breaths to glorify God while hopefully stirring something within the hearts of his captors. He took out his violin and began to play and sing all hail the power of Jesus's name in the native language of the warriors. Amazingly, after singing the first verse, the second, the third, and then beginning the fourth, Reverend Scott realized he was standing and that the angry warriors around him had become perfectly quiet. As he slowly opened his eyes, he saw every spear lowered. There stood those mighty warriors with tears in their eyes. The warriors invited Reverend Scott to stay with them. He stayed with them for two years sharing love of God, and leading many of them to a relationship with Jesus. 
Salvation had come to that place. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. The final point in your outline, the gifts of the Magi. Verse 11, after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped God. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Each gift represented an aspect of Jesus's ministry. The gold, frankincense, and myrrh foretold that he would be king, priest, and savior, respectively. Regarding his kingship, there is a future component and a present-day component. With respect to the former, the Bible says that after his second coming, Jesus will sit on a glorious throne and every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. With respect to the latter, he is currently king over his church. Colossians 1, 17 through 18 says he, that is Jesus, is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. Jesus' work as priest, that is, the intercessor between God and man, again has two components. First, during his earthly ministry, he interceded for his followers. The most salient example of his intercession is in John chapter 17, the high priestly prayer passage. In verse 13 of chapter 17, Jesus asked God that his followers might have his joy fulfilled in themselves. Verse 15, Jesus prayed that they would not be taken out of the world, but that they would be kept safe from the evil one. Verse 21, he prayed that his followers would be one. And verse 20, Jesus prayed for all people who would believe in him on account of the witness of his disciples. The second component of his role as priest began after his ascension into heaven. There, he currently intercedes for his followers. Romans 8, 33 through 34 says, Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Amen. Because Jesus died and was resurrected for our sins, he and only he can plead his blood for our forgiveness of sins, resulting in our justification. Finally, his work as Savior can be summarized with Jesus' own words. Matthew 20, 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus is king, priest, and savior, as symbolized by the gifts of the Magi. But what are we to make of it? What are we to make of that? Very simply, we must submit to him. Only he can cancel the sin debt that you and I have accumulated in our lives. In his death on the cross, he took the punishment that we deserve so that you and I can be made right before God. We must simply come to him in faith and recognize his will for our lives and not our own. John 3, 16 through 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. In summary, Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 15, revealed to us that God supernaturally made known to the Magi the birth of a Jewish king who existed from eternity. Their response was to find him, worship him, and honor him with gifts suited for one who would be king, priest, and savior of the world. That is the true identity of the one we celebrate this season. This Christmas time, 
I invite you to unwrap the most unique and precious gift of all. That is a relationship with Jesus, a gift that will bring you lasting peace, hope, and a joy that satisfies. Let us close by reading one more prophecy about the ministry of Jesus, and that is in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 through 7. So turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Thou shalt multiply the nation. Thou shalt increase their gladness. They will be glad in thy presence and with the gladness of harvest as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou shalt break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders. The rod of their oppressor as at the battle of Midian, for every boot of the booted warrior in the battle of tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be burning fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace, on the throne of David, over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Let us pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you and praise you for the birth of your Son. Uh, thank you for the great joy that that your son brings um, a joy that satisfies, a joy that uh, is never ending, and as a matter of fact, increases as we get older. I just thank you for the, the gift of your son, um, and thank you for the opportunity that everybody, whether Jewish or non-Jewish, have the opportunity to put their faith uh, in your son, that they may be delivered from their sins and live um, in everlasting life um, in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.